Hello. I just want you to know that I'm, first off, not a professional videographer, or YouTuber, blogger, or all that. But, um, and this is off the cuff. I have no script. This is just coming as it comes. So bear with me. My concern is that I'm seeing more and more people complaining about what the world is becoming like. And the sad reality is, is they don't understand how they themselves are a part of the creation of this by their own consent, application, participation, receipt of benefits, uh, by their words, acts, and deeds, uh, with government and corporations and things like that. So this first video is going to be about a legal doctrine that's been around for a very long time. It's called Parents Patre. I'll zoom in here. Parents Patre is how you um, pronounce that. And I'll kind of zoom down here. Here's a uh, Black's Law Dictionary. This is the fifth edition. And you'll see also in uh, these quotes here, what I'm going to show you down here, it pretty much is reciting it. But we'll look at the Law Dictionary first. Parents Patre, uh, literally parent of the country. That's what is highlighted there in green. Refers traditionally to the role of state as sovereign and guardian of persons under legal disability. And that's found in the state of West Virginia versus Chaz, Pfizer and Company, so on and so forth. It is a concept of standing utilized to protect those quasi-sovereign interests, such as health, comfort and welfare of the people, interstate water rights, general economy of the state, etc. Parents Patre originates from the English common law, where the king had a royal prerogative to act as a guardian to persons with legal disabilities such as infants, idiots, and lunatics. In the United States, the parents patre function belongs with the states. State attorney generals have parents patre authority to bring actions on behalf of state residents for antitrust offenses and to recover on their behalf. The use of this power to deprive a person of freedom has been limited by recent laws and decisions. So, see also surrogate parent. Now let's look at a few of these court cases. <coughs> Excuse me. The first one, civil. Now I put that in brackets because the real quote, um, anything you see in brackets here, just something I've put in to clarify. Because there's a difference between uh, three, there's three different types of marriages. A civil marriage, a common law marriage, and a patriarchal uh, matrimonial biblical marriage. And those are all three recognized forms of marriage. Most people don't understand that, uh, and all they're familiar with is the civil marriage. Now, we see here in this case of Van Cotton versus Van Cotton, a civil marriage is a civil contract to which there are three parties, the husband, the wife, and the state. Hmm. Let's see what's next. When two people decide to get married... They are required to first procure a license from the state. If they have children of this marriage, they are required by the state to submit their children to certain things, such as school attendance and vaccinations. That's probably a hot topic right now in this era of COVID-2, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Furthermore, if at some time in the future the couple decides the marriage is not working, they must petition the state for a divorce. Marriage is a three-party contract between the man, the woman, and the state. The state represents the public interest in the institution of marriage. This public interest is what allows the state to intervene in certain situations to protect the interests of the state. The state is like a silent partner in the family. A family member who, has, who is not active in the everyday running of the family, but becomes active and exercises its power and authority only when necessary to protect some important interest of family life. Taking all this into consideration, the question no longer is whether the state has an interest or place in disputes such as the one at the bar, but becomes a question of timing and necessity. 
The state has a wide range of powers for limiting parental freedom and authority in things affecting the child's welfare. In fact, the entire familial relationship involves the state. Hmm. You ever wonder why a social lady can come in and take your child? What you think is your child? Is it your child? It was. But did you somehow do something to cause the state to become the father, the patre, of your child? The primary control and custody of infants is with the government. There is no wider area for the exercise of judicial discretion than that of providing, <coughs> excuse me, for the protecting uh, the best interests of children. The court stands in the position of parents, patre of children. Okay, let me scroll up here. In 1984, the Court of Appeals of Idaho ruled that the state had a compelling governmental interest th that justified restricting the residence of the custodial parent, holding that the best interests of the child had priority over the parent's right to travel. Parents patre, literally parent of the country, refers traditionally to the role of the state as sovereign and guardian of persons under legal disability. Pursuant to the Parents Patre Doctrine, the primary control and custody of infants is with the government to be delegated as of course to their natural guardians and protectors so long as such guardians are suitable persons to exercise it. Hmm. And let's see what this last one says. In other words, the state is the father and mother of the child, and the natural parents are not entitled to custody except upon the state's beneficent recognition that natural parents presumably will be the best of its citizens to delegate its custodial powers. The law devolves the custody of infant children upon their parents, not so much upon the ground of natural right in the, in the latter, as because the interests of the children and the good of the public will, as a general rule, be thereby promoted. Wow. Did you get all that? Now, how does this come about? What did you do? Let's, let's look at just a couple other things here. I think, um, you know, especially p religious people like Christians will, would freak out. Well, these are my children. These are my children. They're God gave me these children. Well, he did. He did. If, you, if you believe that, you know, that God is this um, creative force in the universe that brings life into living things. But then you turned around and contracted with the state. Biblically, we would call this passing your seed through the fire to Moloch. Moloch is a uh, old Canaanite deity, but is the root word of the of the Hebrew word for king, Melech. So it's you're passing your seed through the fire, uh, like on a sacrifice, to the state to be used for the state's benefit. Now look at this. Here's a, here's a discussion, and and I might bring this uh, this little thing up in the future because this was a very interesting uh, debate uh, that happened not too far from where I live back in uh, 1983, and I watched this unfold on television uh, concerning the uh, Bible Baptist Church uh, in Louisville, Nebraska, back in uh, the late 70s, early 80s, 1983, I think, when everything came to a head. But this will give you another indication of how the state looks at things if you have marriage licenses and birth certificates and things of that. And that's the contractual nexus. Fundamental Bible-believing people do not have the right to indoctrinate their children in their religious beliefs because we, the state, are preparing them for the year 2000 when America will be part of a one-world global society and their children will not fit in. Now, that was from then Nebraska State Senator Peter Hoagland. I believe he went on to be a Nebraska governor and 
um, maybe even served in the federal level, I can't remember for sure. It was on Channel 6 in Omaha, Nebraska, in a program called Live at Five, and he was debating this pastor, Everett Sullivan. And what they discovered there was, you know, the state had absolute authority over this church's school that had incorporated under the laws of the state of Nebraska. And that's a very interesting thing to go into at some point, and I'm sure we will. Let's look at um, some parents down in Texas uh, back in 1986 confronted the uh, Texas Attorney General at that time. His name was Jim Maddox. And all these parents had state-issued uh, birth certificates for themselves. Their parents had gone out uh, and, and, you know, gotten the state birth certificate when these children, who are now parents, were born. Uh, these parents, uh, confronting Jim Maddox, were also the children of parents that had a state-issued marriage, civil marriage. And we saw in those in those first quotes that, you know, the state is the superior party in that three-party general contract. Um, it's a special contract, no doubt, but uh, it's still a contract. It has all the conditions of a contract. Um, so here, here's this group of Texans. They all have state-issued birth certificates. They've all got state-issued marriage licenses. So they're married in a civil way, which creates the state as the superior party and controlling power. And they have 14th Amendment federal citizenship and Social Security number. They have all the uh, typical uh, accoutrement of all uh, typical your average American. Uh, is it true that the state of Texas owns our children? The Texas Attorney General Jim Maddox replied, yes, it's true that the state owns your children and not only your children, but you too. Now, where I got this from is they recorded this and they had it recorded in uh, uh, the uh, county recorder's office and I got it from someone from Texas, and, uh, uh, and then I added my little ditty here. Now, before we get to this middle part, let's look down here at some maxims of law. Man, male or female, mankind, is a term of nature. And that's referring to what's called, and we see that in the Declaration of Independence, the law of nature and nature's God. Person of the civil law. And civil law is laws that are made by men as gods. A god is a title, it's not a name. And it, it, El or Theos, Elohim, Eloha, Theos, it all means a mighty one of authority, a lawgiver, a sovereign power, a ruling judge. Uh, those are gods. So men are gods. And this is, the Bible talks about, you know, there's gods many. And the Bible even says that all of us are gods. Because we can all make law by contract and we can all judge and discern and sit on juries and things like that. So um, another maximum of law here says all persons are men, but not all men are persons. Now this, these maxims are very old and they're kind of like, they're kind of like, um, uh, these maxims are kind of like in geometry. They're just accepted rules that everybody real, you know, accepts in the legal uh, system. So if we look at here, I just put this little note in here because this one really needs to be updated. Because a few years ago, New Zealand, the civil government down in New Zealand, uh, gave personhood to a river, uh, and which you know that gives the river civil a civil status, so it can have some sort of civil rights. And I think this was the way the government was trying to go about offering environmental protections to the river. Uh, <clears throat> so really, the last maxim here needs to be updated. Most persons are men, but not all men are persons. Now, a person is really kind of a legal fiction. It's something that um, is not in nature. It's under this civil law. So all corporations are persons. The government is a person because these are legal fictions. These are corporations that are created within the civil law system. So again, if we come up here, I made some notes. These are my opinions on this. What makes this possible that the state could own you? And again, it, these are these are contractual, um, voluntary agreements that you make that create this parents patria relationship, where the state becomes basically your mother and father. Now the Bible also says, "Don't call no man father upon the earth," and this is what it's talking about. So, what makes this possible? 
the state really doesn't own the natural man. Now that's an interesting concept because what this person is, is a mask. It's like a, a fiction. So like an actor is the man, but the character, the fictional character he plays in a movie or on stage, that's the person. So there's a difference between a man and a person. <clears throat> so, you know, the state doesn't own your natural man, the male or female, because the civil state, a civil law corporation, did not create the natural man. However, the state did create the civil law person, a civil law legal fiction. The civil state, as a god, an el, a theo, sovereign power, lawmaker, ruling judge, creates natural and artificial persons, corporations. You're a natural person. This is why it's also... Uh, uh, you have to understand why State Farm and Exxon and AT&T and Twitter and all of these corporations have so much more power than you. Under the 14th Amendment, they have the same rights as you because they're, they're a U.S. person just like you're a U.S. person. So they're operating under the same conditions, but they're just artificial persons. And unfortunately, you, your natural person, is going to die when your natural man male or female dies. Uh, General Electric, how old is General Electric when you consider it a person? You know, these corporations can almost be eternal and they, they obviously outlive most uh, natural persons, the natural man who animates, wears the mask of the civil personality to operate on the civil law stage. And that's really what you're doing, because that's where this concept of legal personality, a legal fiction comes from. It comes from the Greek and Roman theaters back in the day. You know, these jurists saw, went to the theaters and saw actors playing all these different characters on stage. And some actors would play multiple characters in the same play. And it's like, whoa, light, lightning bolt. You know, I can animate several legal fictions within the legal system. You know, I could, I could, I could be a legal, many different legal persons, and that's how this, this kind of came out of the theater, and why it has, you know, like terms like mask. So, <clears throat> in order to, in order to operate on the civil law stage, you have to have this person, this legal personality. Man operates in the state of nature under natural law, the law of God you know, the, the law of nature and nature's God. If, if you want to operate as a person in civil law, well, then you are, you know, in the civil law, you have to have this person. Um, and that's all contractual. It's like if a soldier, if a civilian wants to be a soldier in the military, doesn't he have to sign a contract as a soldier, a military enlistment contract? So, um, that's kind of the same thing. If I want to be now a, a, a soldier, now i got to sign a contract that drags me into a different form of law, which is martial law, military law. In the United States, we call it the Uniform Code of Military Justice, or UCMJ for short. So that's, you know, if I want to operate on the stage of the military, i got to be a soldier, and I have to have a contract, and then I create this soldier uh, persona to operate in the military. So now these state birth certificates, marriage licenses, social security numbers, these are all voluntary. People don't realize that. They're not mandatory. But when you want to operate in civil law as a person, you're going to need these things. And, and that's why most people are in trouble now, because they're so dependent on the commercial civil law for all kinds of things, insurance and employment. These are these are all things within. They're not under common. They're not under the natural law uh, of the Creator God. So especially for religious folks that want to exercise their freedom, uh, this gets in the way, and they don't understand. You know, so when the state comes and thumps them, they're like, "Oh, but I have religious freedom, free exercise." No, 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 no. This all negates all that. Plus, you're probably going to a church that reincorporated under the civil laws of the state and applied to the federal government to be recognized as a 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. So it left its first love because, you know, the creator God is a sovereign power, a lawmaker. So, uh, but then when you reincorporate, uh, that cancels that original corporation. So... Those things that you're calling churches, those are under the authority of the state. And that's why they can control political speech in churches. Ministers can't, you know, really, they're gagged in a lot of ways. Why? Because they're 
artificial persons under parents patre too <laughs> so uh you know so you know, if you if you don't know what the alternative is which is to live a natural life keeping the common law the, the law of god really because the common law has been corrupted too that's a very dangerous phrase you got to be careful of that uh the law of god you know the law of nature and nature's god there is a way to live that way or to live more that way and you can uh, this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he said, you know, are you called being a servant? Care not for it. If you can be free, choose it rather. So it's a journey to get undo these, these quasi-adhesion contracts that we don't call contracts, but they have all the elements of the contract. They got an offer. They got acceptance. There's consideration. And there's usually a time frame and it's usually life or with some licenses, you know, your driver's license might be only for uh, five years or something or two years or whatever. Your marriage license is good for the entire time of your marriage until you divorce or one of your dead, that sort of thing. But um, let's go back to this real quick. I'll show you, see if I can find here real quick um, another term that I think you'll find interesting. Here we go. Just opened up to it pretty close. This is a natural life. This is again from Black's Law Dictionary. Right here, Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition. Uh, natural life. Let's see if I can read this with the camera here. Uh, the period of a person's existence. Well, that's kind of interesting. They're using that word person there because this is a civil law dictionary. Considered as continuing until terminated by physical disillusion or death occurring in the course of nature. Whoa, okay. Used in contradistinction to that juristic and artificial conception of life as an aggregate of legal rights or the possession of a legal personality. Person. Which could be terminated by civil death. Now that's what I did. I, I committed civil suicide. I said, you know, I'm tired of this. I'm done. I'm out. I don't want to be a member of your body politic anymore. And that's what coming out of her, my people, kind of means in the scriptures. Uh, this is that ex ex um, extinction of personality which resulted from entering a monastery or being attained of treason or felony. Now, keep that, you know, that monastery thing, that's kind of important. Um, it's kind of tricky language here, but that's what they're kind of saying is when you, when you return to God, you're, you're going to live a monastic natural life. You're no longer going to live, you're going to have a civil death. Your person, that juristic person that was created by that, that's going to die. That's going to die a civil death. So that means, you know, I'm very limited now and that's the downfall. And that's part of what you need to learn. This may be, you don't, may not want to live a, a die a civil death. You may need that, that parent's patre power. But if you don't know that all that exists, um, you know, you bitch moan and complain about it. Um, and if you don't really like it, you know, there's ways of getting out of it to lessen that amount of regulatory control. Let's see if I have anything else here that I wanted to share in this first video. Yeah, I think I'll leave license for the next time. Um, just I'll leave you with this. The next video I make will maybe look at this in a little depth. Again, this is from the same dictionary. I just put it in a, um, instead of flipping around to the dictionary, I just put it over here. License. Most people think license has to do with competency. Um, not really. That's not how it's legally defined anyway. See what that says. Permission. That's the biggie. Permission. By competent authority, now see there, it doesn't say government, it says competent authority. To do that which without the license, without the permission, would be illegal, a trespass, or a tort. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the primary definition. It kind of goes on to talk about certificate of the document itself, which gives the permission. Leave to do such a thing, uh, la, 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 permission to do a particular thing. Permission to do something which without the license would be would not be allowable. Okay Now think about this when you a long time ago before the state because we didn't always have marriage licenses even here in America It was kind of a subtle way that they brought them in um, 
it was based on this, you know, everybody talks about how America was kind of racist, and I'm not disagreeing with that. And, and state marriage licenses were due to misogynation. So if an African-American, like a freed slave, wanted to marry a white woman or a, a white man wanted to marry a black woman, uh, the state, under civil law, didn't allow that. <laughs> didn't allow that. You had to get a license from the state to uh, uh, interracial marriage. Uh, now, under the law of God, that doesn't matter. You can, that, that's, now, what God does, do, doesn't want you to do is to marry somebody who, regardless of their skin color, has a completely different uh, uh, belief system than you. Because when you marry that someone who has a completely different belief system, they're going to continue bringing their belief system into the marriage and you guys are going to kind of bicker and fight. It has nothing to do with skin color. And that's, that's what God was kind of concerned about in the scriptures of being cautious who you married. Um, you, you, you know, now if, if anybody wanted to be a grafted in like we do here in America, you know, if I want to marry uh, as an American, if I wanted to marry a German woman, and she came over here or, you know, a, a Brazilian woman or a Japanese woman, wherever, doesn't matter. Uh, Ethiopian, doesn't matter. But if we're going to get married and, and she's going to come here, then she's going to want, she's going to have to let go of her culture to a certain degree and adopt the American culture and American legal system and, and, and kind of the American way if we're going to live here in America. And she has to be able to want to do that. Uh, if she doesn't want to do that, well, then that I wouldn't want, I shouldn't want to marry her because that's just going to cause trouble in the marriage. And that's really what the Bible is talking about when it doesn't doesn't want you to marry kind of foreigners. But notice that a license is permission to that is an illegal cause, you know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, <clears throat> just we'll come back to this at some other point. But think about this. The reason you go get a marriage license today is you're already the state's person to your birth certificate. The state is your father. And and before all that, who did we go ask permission to to marry? We we if you're a man, you asked your father for permission, but you also asked your your future bride's father for permission. Uh, if you didn't get his permission, his authority and you just ran off with his daughter, that's illegal. That, that's, uh, that's an illegal act. And we call that a, a, an interloper, a thief. And they ran off and eloped. And that was, that was not a good thing back in the day. It's completely different now under the state because the state is, you know, you're, you're, you know if they went to the state and got the marriage license, it has nothing to do with the parents today because they're just babysitters. They're the state's babysitters. So they already got the permission from the father by getting the marriage license and they can run off and go, go to Las Vegas to the chapel out there and have all kinds of fun they want. They already got the license. So um, why are you in uh, the state's authoritative thumb? Probably parents patre. Probably parents patre through birth certificates, marriage licenses. Thanks for watching. Talk to you again soon.